Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Happy Thursday. It's beautiful and sunny in New York, and I hope it is where you are, too. Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 1023rd New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, Programs Associate here at The Rail, and today I have the huge pleasure and privilege of being your MC for a conversation with Michelle Grabner and Andrew Wilbright. And now it is my honor to introduce today's guest and host. Wisconsin-born and based artist Michelle Grabner is known for her broad perspective developed as a teacher, writer, and critic over the past 30 years. Her art making, which encompasses a variety of mediums including drawing, painting, video, and sculpture, is driven by a distinctive value in the productivity of work and takes place outside of dominant systems. Grabner finds a creative center in operating across platforms and towards community. She's currently a professor of painting and drawing at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She is also the founder and co-director of two nonprofit art spaces in Wisconsin, the Suburban and the Poor Farm, with her husband Brad Killam. Thanks. So Artist, much. curator, and critic Andrew Wolbright is based in Brooklyn. Wolbright is the founder and director of the Gallery Below Grand on the Lower East Side in New York. In addition to curating, he is an editor at large here at The Rail, and he currently teaches at the School of Visual Arts and at Pratt. Thank you so, so much, Michelle and Andrew, for being here. And over to you, Andrew. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us today on this beautiful day here in New York. And I am so excited uh, to get to this conversation because I have so many questions before we even get into it. Um, you know, I got to spend some time in Chicago. I was born there and then grew up in Springfield, Illinois, for the most part, and got to pass through Chicago and its art scene for two years in 2010 to 2012. And I think of that as such a formative time in my life and a time that really foundational to the way I think about moving through space and moving as an artist and the responsibilities of being an artist. And I still think of Chicago so much as a community that has developed the imperative of, if you're an artist, you should also find space for other people. Like I remember, I can't, I've been trying to remember, but I had a professor just say like, if you have an apartment here and you have a spare room, like use it for a gallery, like, what are you doing? Like you're paying all this money for rent or whatever, like you gotta figure out how to use it for a space. And that was just so ingrained in the culture. And I came very quickly to realize that there's a group of people that were responsible for that. But Mary Jane Jacob and Michelle Grabner were the two driving forces. Everyone's like, you got to talk to Michelle. Michelle's really like the one that's making this, this idea. And so Michelle, I just wanted to start off because I feel like I've learned so much from you, um, you know, at a distance, at a space. And I just want to hear, like, not everyone thinks of being an artist and a curator. Not everyone thinks that way of, like, multidimensionality. Who are some of the people, and we can switch over to the slideshow, but I want to just talk about, like, at what point in your life or were there any inspiring forces that made you say, like, I'm an artist, but I also have a responsibility to build out space for other people, too? Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Andrew. It's great to be here and welcome, everybody. Um, yes, uh, Mary Jane Jacobs, Sculpture and Action, 1993, really important. So I came out of grad school in the early 90s, um, and Mary Jane was thinking about community, a very different kind of understanding what how we think about community now, but really thinking about different kinds of sites that artists can engage in. And here is an image of Inigo Magdalena Ovale's street level video. Uh, and then um, just bringing video into those vacant lots in Bucktown um, and in Wicker's Park, in Wicker Park. So um, I remember walking down the street too, and it was the Suzanne Lacey rock drop, like these massive boulders were being dropped along Michigan Avenue and thinking, what is going on? Um, you know, the MCA, the Renaissance Society, our legacy institution, um, the Art Institute, you know, they're exceptional collections, but to actually think of the city as a site in the early 90s was was pretty new. Um, yeah, yeah, so this was an important, this, and Mary Jane, I've been close to Mary Jane. Uh, we work together, uh, we teach together at SAIC. 
we produced a publication through the University of Chicago Press called the Studio Reader. So, you know, I kind of am always following her and her thinking. Um, you know, she does have a different kind of relationship to institutions, um, but we can get into that later when we talk about the poor farm. Absolutely. And um, going off of that, when when did you start curating or start taking on kind of like thinking through space with your yeah. practice? Yep, yep, no, super good question. Um, I, this is this is kind of funny. So we talked a little bit about Chicago, um, coming out of grad school in Chicago. So uh, as you know, thank you, Eleanor. Um, I am chair of painting and drawing at the School of the Art Institute. I've been teaching at the Art Institute since 1996. Um, I've been ping ponging between Milwaukee and Chicago, even though I've been teaching at the School of the Art Institute for quite some time. Right after grad school, I, I was pregnant with my second kid. And I we. My husband, who also came out of UIC, which was a really great program at the time, run by Judith Kirshner, um, he came out of school with Atero Herrera and Tom Friedman, um, and that was, uh, you know, the critical school at the time, uh, and the Art Institute was seen as the intuitive school, um, and that was derogatory back in the early 90s. Um, we had to move to Milwaukee because we couldn't afford a place to raise a family. So when we moved to Milwaukee, we were out of the conversations we were having when we were in grad school. We were missing our colleagues. We were missing those conversations. So finding spaces, organizing exhibitions. I started to write for Freeze at that time um, from the Midwest. So I was you know, arriving all over the place, St. Louis, Chicago, uh, reviewing or freeze magazine. So because Milwaukee was so much smaller and we didn't know anybody then, it was really important for me to start making exhibitions so we could bring our friends here and have those conversations. So that's how it happened. I think if I would have stayed in Chicago, I probably would have been complacent with, with what was already there. Huh. That makes total sense. Can we go back to slide three? Because uh, I know Jerome Sands also played a role kind of in that early moment. Uh, indeed, he did. If you go one more slide back, Eleanor, and it's just, and this is, this is shocking to me. Um, so this is Vogel Hall. This is at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And Milwaukee has an exceptional film school. Um, and in the 90s, a colleague of somebody who came out of school, and I did my undergrad at UWM, Peter Doroshenko, uh, started running the Institute of Visual Arts in this building, um, this old Tudor schoolhouse. And he, he brought on Jerome Sanz, um, uh, Pedro Alonso, and some other international curators. And I was seeing, after we moved to Milwaukee, um, and again, trying to create exhibitions where we were bringing our colleagues up from Chicago, um, they were they were making exhibitions where Maurizio Catalan was coming to UWM, uh, Pierre Wieg, uh, Seal Floyer, um, Dominic Gonzalez Forster. So again, having this interface with artists who are coming in from the outside, Milwaukee could have cared less. The rest of the community in Milwaukee didn't know what they were doing and didn't care. It felt like we were an audience of one. Um, and then just paradoxically trying to find some images of those installations at Vogel Hall from the 90s, they kind of don't exist. I can't find anything. So that's you're looking at, you know, the outside of the building. Uh, but they were that was really important to me, seeing what can happen um, without an audience, quite honestly. The, even the school didn't care. The art department nor the art history department was really invested in what Peter Dorshenko was doing with his uh, um, adjunct curators and with the artists he was bringing in. Yeah, and that was uh, Catalan. If I'm not mistaken, Catalan's first institutional show here in America, and Pierre yes. Weeks, like their first time. I mean, yes. incredible. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And again, you know, a, a hand, an audience. Uh, you know, there had to be, you know, again, in Milwaukee, five people who cared, and my husband and I were two of those people. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Love that. Well, I mean, I, you know, I was just talking to Fox and Molly before this conversation. I was like, you know, like I think that great art comes from you know some type of alienation absence and like when when you have to generate your own community when you're two of the five i think it, it you know it, it it's led to so many wonderful things so let's get to some of those wonderful things uh with your start with the suburban uh which i think plays into before we get into the poor farm yeah that's uh, exactly you talk right. about the formation of of that or when you started uh working through that i think that slide yeah slide. yeah one more slide next slide yeah that's that's the family in the poor farm garden but maybe next slide yeah. give us a sense of what this i think is. slide eight maybe. yeah there we go Perfect. Or, yeah. okay got it. so this um 
So in, gosh, what year? 2097, I took a full-time teaching job at the University of Wisconsin. Um, but my husband uh, was appointed curator at Loyola University. He was staff, so we moved to Chicago. We moved to Oak Park, actually. Um, and then it was my obligation to commute back and forth to the University of Wisconsin, which is about two and a half hour drive from Oak Park. Um, so we were able to, at this point, it was again, risky, 97, we had young kids. We bought this little house in Oak Park and Oak Park is notable because of Frank Lloyd Wright. That's where his home and studio is. It's also a first spring suburb of Chicago. Um, so uh, while we were there, young kids um, back in Chicago, um, a lot of our colleagues, while we were doing that stint in Milwaukee, kind of moved on, moved on to New York or Berlin or London or LA. Um, so we really kind of had to build uh, a community again um, on our own. Uh, you know, the fact is with young kids, it was really hard to travel. That would usually make sense, right? We travel the world, we see art and such. So we had to bring art to us. It was really quite simple. How do we think about um, opening up a small exhibition space in uh, uh, the outbuilding in Oak Park and invite people? I, I often think that we probably wouldn't be brazen enough to do it now because we invited people like Luke Toymans and Katerina Grossa and they all showed up. Um, uh, Gavin Turk from London. Uh, and I think it had to do with Chicago. A lot of artists were interested in coming to Chicago and, you know, all they, they do business in New York, um, but Chicago, not so much. So, um, and also it, it's, you know, it's, it's not a not-for-profit, it's just an artist-run project space. So there was little risk and it was small. And here you're looking at Andrea Sattel, Center Smockers. So um, this was the project in which she was making uh, uh, smocks and these, three lovely folks um, actually stitched the smocks together for her. So we turned actually in this case, the house into the smock shop. So this was an old Andres Sattel project. Huh, that's really incredible. I, yeah, I was, uh, I was it, education wise, I was in Chicago during Toyman's MCA show. And that was like quite the, quite the moment. I'm just wondering, I mean, I think it'd be helpful and I'm already feeling just pressed for time because of how much there is to get through. Yeah. Um, but and there's a whole other conversation I'd love to talk about your art and practice, because I know sometimes like when you're a curator, we talk about curating, but like I love your work as well. But I'm thinking just to keep this together, I'd love to talk about curation and entry points or like thinking about how you, what your entry points are into inviting people into shows. Like in the suburban, how many of these were done by studio visits? How many of them were done by, this is an artist, I want to use the space. Is space coming first or is it through community? How are you finding these shows in the beginning? Yeah, no, excellent question. Um, It wasn't through space. It was basically what were the conversations that I wanted to be part of and firsthand, right? So as artists come to Oak Park, you know, they stayed in the extra bedroom, right? So we were... You know, we'd have conversations over breakfast. So it was really kind of coming to the house, coming into a, uh, this kind of intimate visit. Visit. So the you know, it was the people who were doing interesting things and I wanted to have conversations with them and conversations that I could then take into the classroom, right? So there's always the kind of responsibility that teachers have not to, you know, drum into students' heads uh, the, works and, the work and the idea, the ideas that drive my personal work, but you know, to be responsible for the broader discourses that are happening in culture at any given time. And to do that firsthand was really important. And also to use it a little bit as a lab where some of my students can come in and help the artists out. This is Tony Fair. Um, Tony just got back from the Istanbul Biennial for this piece and taped up the window and was thinking about stained glass and Islamic pattern making. And again, the space was very small. I mean, it was 10 feet by 10 feet. And again, a cinder block outbuilding that eventually we were able to, because of actually Luke Toymans, able to build an additional, much more uh, conventional white cube, but again, not much larger. I mean, we're looking at maybe 10 by 20. So we had these two spaces going on. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, so it, when, when you're inviting these artists, like how much are you, how much input are you giving at this stage with the suburban? Are you uh, planning these projects with them or is it really an invitation to saying you come in, do what you're going to do and I trust you? Yep. That's exactly right. We trust whatever you want to do. Um, some people will send a crate and never show up and then we will put up that work. And some people here, we have Katerina Grosso working with Molly Sackerman-Hartung and Dana DiGuglio 
um, mixing golden paints that then you know get pushed through the uh, the, the compressor. Um, and Molly and Dana were students at the time, so kind of bringing them in and having that experience. Um, mm -hmm. And you know we can offer artists very little outside of a place to stay and uh, food while they're here. Um, and then if they do leave objects behind, we will get them back with our FedEx ground account. Um, it's really that simple. That's what we can do. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes people will inquire about acquiring work and we just send them to the artist. We have no, we don't operate as any kind of middleman at all. We just send them directly to the artist. Could you, uh, before we move on to, and get into the, the, the poor farm, could we uh, just, I'm interested in like what your definition might be of like what an alternative space is, or did you define this as an alternative space or how would you define that? Or is that yeah, too much of an yeah. anti-definition? No, no, I think, you know, we still lean into it being an artist run project space and that tradition. Um, so an alternative space, um, yes, I guess to a certain degree, I think the suburbs were important. Like, mind you, this is still in Oak Park, which was not Chicago. And, but that, you know, was a two block separation between we, before we would actually, be, you know, to Chicago. So it was close, like I said, first ring suburb, but thinking about, you know, the kind of leafy green protective area that Frank Lloyd Wright was interested in as a place, not just where women raised children, uh, you know, back in the 1800s, but actually um, a place where the imagination can uh, thrive. Um, a kind of thinking can flourish in the suburbs, which is very different because we often think that it's, um, you know, an urban or cosmopolitan center where those uh, discourses or ideas can emerge from. So really kind of thinking about this other space um, and then also the practicality of literally wanting to send our kids to a public school and doing that in Oak Park. Um, and then, you know, uh, what we pulled in as, you know, faculty, um, to be able to support this project. Here you're looking at, I just wanna say it was kind of one of, this was the last project before the suburban move up to Milwaukee because we moved back up to Milwaukee in 2015. This is the last project by a Chicago artist who basically um, nested the suburban in a simulacra of a suburban in a simulacra of the suburban and got increasingly smaller. I love that. Can can we go back one slide too? Cause um, yeah, it looks Wally Beshti here. Uh, and I, you know, it's funny because like when you're describing you joining the Art Institute and saying that it was the intuitive school, by the time I came through and kind of got a snapshot of it, I felt like most of the students were thinking about like Hans Hock and systems and really like the dematerialized art object in this exciting way. And I, I, I don't know how I would answer this question, but I'm wondering if how much responsibility you take for that, because I feel like you're really inviting artists that you know, are, are in that tradition more. Sure. Which is exciting. Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting question. And thank you, Andrew, because nobody really asked that. Um, I was grad advising, as, as I said, I stepped into the School of the Art Institute in 1996 as a grad advisor. Um, I did not get a full-time position there until um, about 2003. And um, it was a painting and drawing department that was still shaped by the imagists. Right, mm -hmm. the kind of imagination that the imagists, um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, how how the images frame that city um, and their thinking, um, and I remember several times um, because I was doing a lot of writing and even um, a lot of curating. Even well, I applied so many times, but I kept getting the feedback like you're not a real artist, like you're not in the tradition of the Chicago school, which was how the department represented. Um, I am too analytical. I'm thinking critically. Um, you know, the department has changed, obviously. It's been a long time and the department has evolved. And we have a lot of those artists who are represented um, now within the department as faculty. But yeah, it was, um, you know, it was a slow kind of break for the identity of, you know, a very historic department in a historic school. Um, totally. Yeah. That makes total sense. Yeah. I, I remember distinctly now there's like the kind of gym nut tradition. And then there's all this exciting energy of like, what are you doing making something or what are you doing making a painting? Like you should be reading Derrida and like figuring out how to, you know, do a conceptual piece. So yes. yeah, yeah, really exciting. Let's uh, move forward to, I'd love to talk about Dana's piece, uh, art sure. work, conceptual piece. I think that slide. Yep. 15. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what happened yeah, there here? You go. yeah. Um, 
Okay, so I have my narrative and this was happening, I think at the same time I was working on the biennial. So my eye was off of the suburban, right? So the suburban, even though it's attached, it's domestic, it is part of the home, my eye was pulled elsewhere to a different kind of stage. Um, Dana, uh, through and through from Chicago, went to undergrad and graduate school at the Art Institute. Um, she was she was looking to get out. She was getting, she was trying to kind of harness some momentum to be propelled out of the city. And at this point, the suburban um, has become, you know, almost like an institution. People know who is showing there. It's It had a kind of a hold. Um, people knew about it. Um, Dana, as a student and now as a colleague and a friend, um, she did some editing for me. And in trade for some editing, I think I was publishing something, um, I gave her a drawing that she took to my gallery, James Cohan, and sold back to the gallery, used that money to go to Indiana to buy this old Impala. And then she asked if she could drive it through the Suburban. And I said, yes, because I say yes as much as I can. Um, and this goes back to your other question, Andrew. They do not curate the Suburban. I mean, I do my, I have to schedule and that's kind of, and that is hard enough. And I don't want to do more than that. So mm -hmm. things show up in front of me and I plug them in. So I'm not actively curating the suburban. It kind of evolves itself. So Dana said, uh, asked if she could do this. I said, yes, she gave me a time. She bought a bunch of students. We created a ramp so she could get a little speed off of Lake Drive so she could actually create that impact. I asked her to do a little safety work because I didn't want her to injure herself. Um, and on a Saturday, rainy Saturday morning, she uh, she rammed, she, she didn't go in nose first. That was a safety issue. She backed into the building and unmoored it. Um, it was so important um, as a gesture because she moved to New York and she, I keep trying to get her to move back to Chicago and she won't. Um, this was enough to propel her out, but it also jarred me enough to think about and reassess the suburban after, you know, 15 years. What has it become? What is it good at doing? Um, you know, when am I keeping my eye off? Um, you know, and also um, it's 25 years old, almost 26 years old. You know, that is a long time and you can see when it falls in and out of cultural relevance. Right. Um, you can just see the pressures of culture, embrace it and then turn its back on a project. Um, and I kind of needed uh, this project and Dana's project to really help me think that through and to do some assessment. So, yeah, it was, you know, it was a little bit like screw your teacher, screw your friend, yeah. screw your mother. I mean, there's a lot of psychology there right. that you all it's not it's pretty simple, um, but you're all probably very aware of it. Well, also, I mean, get, let's building off, let's build off that metaphor and that psychology, because I also want to talk to you. Um, you know, I, I'm hearing wonderful things about the current biennial, but your biennial that you helped curate is still considered one of the best ones of the last two decades. And you do have this amazing ability to go from um, major museum exhibition shows with, you know, 50, 60 artists in them to also thinking about projects you know, in this kind of Harold Zaman way of like doing a big show and then going back to like a smaller show and like regathering. And I just want to use this car that seems like also a point of collision of you talking about that biennial. How, how does your mind frame shift from doing something that large and that organized to something that you're also very equipped and used to doing? How, how do you think of that show and what are the entry points for like a 50 artist show that you're looking for to begin? Yeah, no. Um, good question, Andrew. Uh, I think though it's not, you know, there's shifts, but the shifts come in the requirements of the exhibition itself, um, and the expectations of the exhibition and the audience. Those are given. I'm, you know, and I work with those givens. I work really well with limitations. So, um, you know, what are the conditions of the biennial? Uh, in 2014, it was structured very differently. Um, Stuart Comer, um, Anthony Elms, and I each got a floor. It was the last biennial in the Breuer building. Um, you know, I once I'm there, I can stretch a little bit. Um, but I think what holds it all together, this ability to move from the suburban, which again, it still runs in Chicago, excellent exhibition right now by Heather Gurton, um, you know, Poor Farm, um, you know, curating the exhibition at the Milwaukee Art Museum that we were talking about a little bit before um, we went live. Um, 
you know, they're, it's my responsibility. If I get these invitations, I need to give back to artists. I mean, I, I don't mean to sound Pollyannish about it, but um, I do a lot of curating for the Kohler company. I'm the Kohler company curator up in Sheboygan. You know, I don't need the job, but the job has interesting opportunities for artists that are very different than not-for-profit opportunities. So, uh, and I'm always curious about, uh, you know, what those opportunities can be, what those conditions are, and how it can help move culture, how we can think about where we are differently. So I would say that they're all very, very similar ethically. Mm -hmm. They just change structurally what is required of, you know, one curatorial, uh, you know, assignment to another. Yeah, working within the frame and finding the spaces of kind of bending yeah. the, the frame. I love that. Well, let's, with that, uh, switch to the poor farmer. If we could catch up to uh, this current project, which from the outside, and I could be wrong in this, really feels like an engine of kind of everything. It's a residency. It's a summer school. It's also at times almost takes the shape of like a biennial or like a real large invitation, but that can also be really um, researched solo projects or invitation. How did this come about and and where in your life was this that you took this on? Yeah, um, practical again. Uh, and I think many of you will appreciate this. Um, 2007, 2006 to maybe 2008, I had a solo uh, a survey exhibition that was moving around the country. Um, it was organized by Illinois State University and it was going to other universities, um, you know, in the American interior. And um, my husband and I have a, a, a studio on a river, which is about a half a mile down the lane from the poor farm. And I think it was Memorial Day, we were driving out and I said, you know, I got all these crates of work coming back. Where are we going to put them? Um, and I said, wasn't the poor farm for sale? Did I not see a sign at the building, you know, that we were looking at? And, um, you know, so we made an inquiry uh, that same week and the guy sold us the building. And this was in 2008. Um, banks were still giving loans before we had our global collapse. Um, and probably by October, um, you know, we had it. Uh, so, you know, it and it never stored, doesn't store art. I mean, that's the paradox. That's what we bought it for in terms of thinking about space and collections can go there, you know. Um, and it, it we never brought work there. Some of it has to do with the raw condition of the space, but we have leaned into that raw condition as, um, you know, a site of, uh, you know, thinking through what the kind of indiscernible something else can be. And I would say in short, um, Andrew, I'd like to think of it um, as, more of an appeal than a project space or a plan. An appeal, meaning that um, it as an idea, as a place, as a site, um, appeals to artists who have ideas um, and to let that host those ideas, to let artists kind of flourish through some kind of thinking. Um, that thinking has to be pretty, I don't wanna say rigorous, but pretty compelling by the fact that the poor farm offers very little but a rural site in Wisconsin that again is pretty rudimentary. Um, you know, it's not Yaddo where a beautiful lunch will come uh, to your door, um, you know, every day that you are in resident. Um, so, so yeah, it keeps kind of evolving and moving and breathing in its own way. So really seeing it as um, an appeal as opposed to a fixed project. However, um, you know, we also use the space as a site that can, can evolve ideas that blind spots uh, centers should probably do, but they're blind spots in these centers. Um, this is uh, Guillaume Leblanc, um, an artist who's been based in New York for a long time. He's a French artist and he did a residency up there where he was casting, digging out big holes and casting concrete. And then we brought the concrete into the into the poor farm itself. Um, but I think the what we did a couple very large exhibitions that um, really did some uh, good work, and that is the Gretchen Bender show. So Gretchen Bender, um, her television performances to to transfer those old beta tapes into digital, to reposition them, to work with Robert Longo, to work with Cindy Sherman on what they meant initially, to create that exhibition, to publish a catalog, and to bring that exhibition to the kitchen. The kitchen in New York probably should have done this show, but again, you know, that 
they have, they have their own agenda. They're moving and flowing the way they do. Um, you know, Bender was really important uh, to my work and to um, uh, an artist and former student, Phil Vanderheiden. So we can we put this show together. And now the work, this is a great thing. And now that Bender's work, um, you know, lives at MoMA, lives at the Art Institute. And it wouldn't have if the Art Inst if we at the Poor Farm didn't kind of manifest it and, and restage that work. Do we, yeah, I think that's slide 34, just so we can uh, jump to that. Um, yeah, can can you go into just a little more detail? I mean, it's, so it's, uh, she was an artist that you, uh, uh, your collaborator knew about, uh, wanted to research more about, but like, how, how else did this come about this show? Like getting and identifying and like, how long did this show take to put on? And like, what was the process like? Yeah, um, and I'm happy to say we got some Warhol support. So Warhol over the years, um, you know, have, have supported the Poor Farm um, and mostly projects, um, not the residency, but supported this project. And that allowed us to, um, to work with somebody who, what happened is she died in 04. I think I have that right. So you would know Gretchen Bender because she was uh, partners with Robert Longo. Um, she and Robert did a lot of MTV videos together. Um, and Rear Crit was actually her studio assistant. Um, so back, you know, she's, she's kind of loosely affiliated with the picture generation, but that's a little erroneous. I mean, I think in shorthand, we can throw her there, but she was really thinking about the anxiety of um, media at the time, the same way we think about anxiety now around social media. She was thinking about anxiety with television commercials um, and using computer generated imagery for the first time in her videos, you know, um, uh, Stuart Algebright uh, did all the sound work for her. Stuart is a musician who works in New York. I um, mean, really creating these almost operatic, uh, you know, television performances um, that she actually made for the kitchen um, uh, back in the late 80s. So uh, she died in 08. Um, Robert and Cindy basically packed up just boxes and boxes of tape, shipped them to her sister, I want to say in the South. I'm not remembering at the time. But anyways, we were able to get this material and then transfer it to video um, and, you know, work with uh, the televisions and, you know, do all the research. Um, and everybody was helpful um, because I think a lot of her colleagues at the time did think that she was overlooked. Her work really pivoted in the 90s. So it doesn't look anything like that. Um, she also did the credits to America's Most Wanted, which probably most of you who are seeing this right now don't even remember that television show. Um, and then we put together that exhibition or that catalog that really uh, started to uh, get, recontextualize her um, and her work. Well, it's interesting, you know, like I'm, you know, I'm wondering how well this fits or feels appropriate, but thinking about looking through all the exhibitions you put on, it does seem like, um, you know, this kind of adjacency to pictures that at times kind of becomes, you know, what would later be picked up with like post internet of like, or the, you know, this relationship to images that can be printed out are fragile are like, you know, site specific and this, I, you know, like I was uh, going back to that, um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the artist's name, but that wall painting with like the Donald Duck and the, you know, yeah. I loved, I loved the text that went with that piece, which was like, uh, yeah, 20, I think it's slide 20. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's like what happens when the infant terrible become middle-aged, you know, yes. and I think yeah. there's this kind of, I, I don't know. Like, I, I wonder how it feels. Like, I think there's something that the the poor farm is doing where between Wally Beshti and this um, and a few others and like Gretchen, obviously, that there's like a type of site specific image thing happening, maybe. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. No, I haven't thought about that. This uh, just a little backstory. This is Chris Barandio. Chris Barandio. Um, you know, was actually in Mary Jane Jacobs Culture and Action exhibition. And went to school um, at UIC with my husband, um, took a job at Rice where he teaches now. And at some point he just called up and said, you know, I've lost my muse. Can I come up to the poor farm? Can I look at the clouds? And supposedly this is what he saw in the clouds. Um, but that is a really good example of what uh, the poor farm can do. But I think to your point, again, with a practical frame, you know, the poor farm, you know, it is a porous porous institution. Um, it's solid. It's built well. Um, we put on a new roof. But again, um, like the suburban, the poor farm really is built in the economy of, you know, 
the salaries my husband and I get from teaching. Um, yes. So it has to evolve slowly. Um, and we're okay with that. That is not a deficit. That is exactly what it should do. And it gives an alternative to how we think about how institutions typically run or the credentialized residency. Um, you know, this is something else and it's uh, something that's valuable to me. I mean, it's highly, it's a highly experimental environment. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Well, can, I mean, I think that's really incredible and what I'd like to maybe spend a little more time developing, which is like, can we talk about just like something as, as light as like the scheduling of it? Cause it does seem like it switches form. There's sometimes like major exhibitions up for a while or something, you know, sometimes it's a, a school, like, yeah. how are you kind of, is, yeah. is it through your and your husband's excitement or like, how are you planning out like this formlessness or shaping it? Yeah. Stuff? Yeah. And some of it, again, going back to the porousness of the architecture, but also the profound seasons of, um, you know, Northeastern Wisconsin, um, sure. you know, it does have to go into hibernation in the wintertime until we can do some geothermal situation where we can heat it uh, year round. Um Yes, at the end of the spring semester, there's always seminars from the School of the Art Institute who use it as um, a, you know, a weekend or a week residency to kind of wrap up the semester and have those conversations. Um, exhibitions typically last a year, right? We'll open them in summer and then they will, you know, last to then, you know, go through the, the into the following summer where we'll go through a rotation. Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, seasons definitely, the seasons definitely drive it, um, you know, just its economy, its tiny little economy also uh, drives it. Um, and then need, and, you know, it's, there's no application. I mean, this is, you know, I have to, you know, I'm resisting again, some of the traditional measures of what a residency can or should be, um, because I don't want it to be a credential. I want it to be used again as a place, um, um, again, that somebody can, uh, you know, think um, to see it as an experimental environment and to actually use that experimental environment to kind of foster something, whether it's Barandia who has no ideas at all and really kind of needs to try to think through and grab onto something or, um, you know, just being in a place where conversations can happen. Something really important is during that Gretchen Bender show or during the exhibition that's up currently, um, or the Sky Hub Pinkus show, and I'm just naming um, uh, exhibitions that you know are notable from a general mm -hmm. art audience, you know, you are the, the those who come up um, are, are living in the exhibition, right? So there is like the interface between the housing and the housing is in the back part of the house exhibition in the front part of the house and there's just a fluid interplay between bodies and exhibitions so if a group comes from the performance department at the school of the art institute you know they're performing in the current exhibition and around the current exhibition or taking breakfast there so there's that kind of fluidity between inside outside between the dorms or the domestic uh, part of the house poor farm and the exhibition part of the poor farm. Um, so that fluidity is really um, important. But again, I think, you know, to answer your question, it goes back to seasons. Um, you know, we, we have to shut down in late fall and um, it's been profoundly scare, it's scary, but it's warm here now. So we're able to open it up early. Mm -hmm. Well, just like, I mean, I really appreciate that answer and the way you think through things because as you know it's incredibly rare it's becoming rare like even artist run spaces are thinking of themselves as like white cubes and like just the the ability to like live in the space you'll work in or like something closer like think with your head or like 112 green street like the idea that you can like really get to know a space and like respond to it is like becoming really infrequent especially here in new york where yeah. in the last 20 years every artist run gallery is trying to figure out a way to become a mega gallery that's run by artists, uh, which is, uh, it's fine, but it's really uh, limiting. And yeah. it's really great to to think in this other way. Um, yeah, I mean, can we talk a little bit about like the school while we're on this topic, of, like facilitating conversations? Um, the school at the poor farm? The yeah. 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 And the school, uh, there is an artist based in Minneapolis who was uh, doing this great work where it was St. Cloud, University of Minnesota, um, um, North, 
Western is up there. Um, a handful of the smaller schools, uh, liberal arts schools in the Minneapolis area, um, including St. Cloud State, um, which is actually a big school, and then uh, bringing people down, artists down. Some of them were undergrads who now went on to grad school and now are practicing artists and keep coming back on a regular basis. Um, and that school is just a gathering of whoever wants to join in and have conversations around the week in which the artists um, or any other kind of visitors are there to have these kind of conversations. And then there will be readings. Again, super simple, super you know, basic in terms of structure. Um, and then kind of just letting it flow. Once you bring people together from different places, you put a couple common denominators in front of them, like an exhibition, some artwork, some reading, and seeing what happens, starting to gather, starting to acknowledge that we all share this right now, and seeing that collection of folks kind of splinter off and have their own conversations and then come back in. Um, the, uh, the, I should say a little bit about the practicality of uh, the poor farm. We have approximately 17 beds because the poor farm housed in uh, the engine at poor. Um, so during these big weekends, people will often come and you can see here, um, you know, have to pitch a tent um, to be part of those conversations or to join in. And, you know, everybody is welcome. Hmm. I really love that. Um, I mean, I want to pivot a little bit too of just thinking that like, I mean, it is, it's such a dynamic model you've created and I'm wondering, and maybe you already answered this a little bit um, uh, with other curation, but like, I just wonder, you know, going back to this idea of the appeal, are you, do you think you're curating through community since you don't have like an open call or like people submitting things? Is it, is it like, are you, is it word of mouth that you really rely on a few artists to kind of, you know, talk through ideas together or your husband or like, how are you, you know, picking the next project, I guess? Like, do you have your people that you really trust and rely on? Or is it really, you know, based on your own conversations and the conversation you need to have? Yeah, no, I think it does go back to that answer that I gave you when we we're talking about the suburban. It does have to do with conversations the poor farm has a very unique and specific American history, actually North American history that um, um, as an institution was, a, it was a localized governmental institution, again, that housed inmates. Um, uh, it was agricultural servitude. Uh, you know, we find it obscene now, um, and it was obscene then as well, but at the time it was thought as a progressive social movement. Um, to gather those who are unhoused, who are who uh, are impoverished, and to assign them as inmates to these poor farms or poor houses, which are in the city. Um, there's a graveyard in the back. I think we went through some images of the graveyard in which Lily Cox Richard stalled some mushroom uh, fairy uh, circles. Um, so it was a full. It was, it was troubling. It was absolutely troubling as a as a social institution. It dissolved in the 30s when the Social Security Act came into play where people were supported as opposed to having to be institutionalized. Um, so I say all of that because that history is an important history. We don't talk about it enough. It was county run. Um, it was an institution that often was um, adjacent to what was what we would call estate asylums or orphanages. So all social ills were gathered and institutionally um, overseen. Um, huge problem. Um, and thinking about that history now, um, even with the exhibition uh, model home that is currently running, um, you know, thinking about that history and thinking about um, discrepancies um, uh, of class right now, who has, who doesn't have, um, and really kind of thinking about that as a history, but, but putting it into a contemporary context, thus the exhibition model home um, that kind of again looks at um, inequities um, around wealth um, right mm -hmm. now. So I, it's not a direct answer to your question, Andrew, but I think it's the place. Its history is always rich enough to to embrace ideas, um, and it doesn't have to be so directly researched or political. It can just be a place of 
wild aesthetic imaginings at a place in rural Wisconsin that is profoundly, profoundly conservative at this point. And I could spend a lot of time going into um, what Wapaka County is, the identity crisis of once being farmers and no longer being farmers, but still living as if one was. Uh, it gets very complicated up there. And I think, you know, the work so, you know the work that we do is is just bringing people from different parts of the world to this profoundly profoundly conservative and angry mm -hmm. environment this rural environment um my goal is we're located right between green bay and the fox river valley which is a beautifully diverse liberal uh uh uh, area and then Stevens Point, which has a UW system, which would lead to another kind of wider embrace of ideas, and we are smack in the in between, and it's very very red. And I, you know, would you know just by the fact that the poor farm is located there, you know, I'm hoping that that can start to create a kind of bridge of different kind of thinking that happens in the state of Wisconsin. And we know that Wisconsin is a highly politicized state, very important on a national stage as well. Um, you know, so just just by its place and by its history, whatever happens there, whatever ideas happen there is profound. Um, and I value them. And again, we go back to like, we try to say yes. We try to say yes. Um, yeah, uh, you're looking at a, a, a piece that's currently um, at the Suburban. This is uh, by Phil Vander Heiden. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's an eight channel video, I had to count. Um, a large eight channel video installation. And this goes back to your question about images. Um, you know, videos work really well because of the environment, right? Yeah. Uh, objects and the, start to, in, uh, yes, yeah. I was just gonna say that influence of Gretchen Bender too. Yeah, it comes through. Yeah, that, Bill. Bill was my, yes, that's right. Well, can we can we circle back because I, I do think that's like really interesting and I've run some spaces, you know, not in metropolitan areas and it is that really tricky balance of like trying to do something avant garde in a neighborhood that's you're like a area that's incredibly conservative. I'm wondering, like, have you had a lot of interactions with the surrounding community or like how are how are how is the poor farm welcomed or considered yes. Yes. by the area? Yeah, and it's it's complicated as it should be. Um, you know, we have uh, the farmer Leon across the way has a cattle farm, you know, solid Trump voter, but will come, loves, he will, comes over all the time, um, you know, and wants to interface with the artists and, you know, will actually uh, deputize his tractor to pull people who are at the poor farm down to the river, um, you know, and really is, but then we have other neighbors who, uh, you know, just can't deal with it, just, you know, can't deal with it um, and our backs are turned. So it's complicated, um, yeah. you know, yeah. And it's going to continue to be complicated. Quite yeah. honestly. Well, I mean, I, I, I really think it's important what you're doing and, and, um, and really relate to it on a lot of different uh levels but one of them just being what you said which is that like uh, i think most of the people in this room know but i it frustrates me in new york how people talk about uh trump voters or anything else like they're often the trump voters i know in my life are incredibly kind you know and it's such a disconnect uh from the way they vote often and i feel like that it's really important work to develop relationships however it is of um talking to those people and realizing that there's not this great divide uh, or yeah. there's a way to open that. So it's really great. Can we talk about this work? Uh, it's a really cool idea of a piece or conceptual yes. painting that I always love. Yeah, it is. It is a great piece. Um, John Schnabel, an artist based in New York, has been around for a long time. Um, when uh, Peter Scott, Peter Scott is a, a New York based artist and curator who runs Cura Trade uh, on Grand in Chinatown. Um, when I was mentioning that we were really thinking about, you know, the history of the poor farm and actually thinking about David Graeber and creating a David Graeber Institute and what that may be and let the poor farm kind of host that because Graeber's research really thinking about economies. And so Peter, pitched the exhibition that's currently at Model Home um, and included John Schnabel's work, which is um, a big vinyl blow up of a drawing he made when he, can't remember it specifically, let's say second grade, first or second grade in a Catholic school the day that um, 
uh, JFK was shot in Dallas. And it says, you know, pray for us. Um, and he's still a little confused about how he would have got that information. Were the nuns telling him about it? You know, was there an old television channel going on? But this was a drawing he made and then um, enlarged it. And it's, you know, it's actually much more impacting um, in person. It's quite, it's quite large. So that's what this piece is. Hmm. No, I, I mean, I, you know, love Jennifer Bartlett and anyone thinking about the complicated conceptual ability to like reperform a painting or like perform an image or a painting in different ways. I think it's such a cool piece. I'm I'm wondering like for your like going to your group shows. I know I keep asking like structural questions, but how are you thinking about it when you do have to deal with eight artists or 50 artists? Like who's the first person you typically want to talk to and do a studio visit with and you know, what's a studio visit like from you? You know, are you asking questions mostly? Or are you looking for certain answers from people? What are you looking for? No, I, I love studio visits. Um, uh, it was interesting to me because when I was working on the Whitney Biennial, I would not invite an artist unless I was in their studio or for those close studio artists, sat down with a laptop on a picnic bench in the park, right? And kind of going through that work. So I wouldn't even think of it, never even occurred to me. But then I was realizing that Stuart and Anthony were just picking up the phone and calling people without having that, you know, they knew what they right. wanted, right? Yeah. And that just wasn't my process. And, you know, I don't disparage that process, um, but it, you know, it, it feels respectful. Um, and I tell students this all the time as my students are shipping work to galleries in New York, sight unseen uh, with a little Zoom talk. Um, you know, it is respectful that the people who are interested in your work come to the space of making and encounter that work in person. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, being in the studio is, is, and I'm comfortable there and I feel like I can ask those kind of questions and I'm, you know, it's, it's a conversation that happens. Um, but when it comes to building exhibitions, whether it was Front International in 2018, that was a major exhibition at multiple institutions in Cleveland and Akron and Oberlin. Um, there are some touchstones that I will go to. There's a certain kind of, when you have to bring in so many artists, if, you, if you're working with all new artists, let's say I'm building a show around 86 artists, if there are people I've never worked with before, the kind of unknown is too risky. Um, you know, artists have patterns, artists have a way of using language, arts, artists have way of, ways of communicating um, very differently with uh, curators. So I would have to say that there always has to be a touchstone of artists who I can, like I know their process, I know their patterns. I know that, you know, this will come to fruition in this way. And then there is a certain amount of artists that I've never worked with before, but the work is compelling. The work is speaking to the context that we're in, or it's pushing at the context that we're in. And then I can make room for the unknown. Um, you know, I am always admirable of those curators who, you know, just cast the net into, you know, those who they've never worked with before. I need to have some foundations in place. Um, I would have to say since the Venice Biennale, I, I worked and then commissioned some work from Dawood Bay, um, you know, twice. Uh, Dawood and I are old friends. We've worked together and I know and I can trust that he will always with the opportunities I give him push his practice forward. So it's not artists that it's like I need that work again or I want this body of work. It's artists who I know their working process but who also meet me at the possibilities of what can happen. So they're being stretched too. So that is um, that is important. I love that. I, I always think of curation on some level, like I, I came from a baseball background and Casey Stengel was like, I can build any team if I have Yogi Berra on the team. You know, like you kind of need those like Dawu Bays or the people where it's like, I can ask them to do something and rely on them to really go for it and push it and like, that can be a consistent moment that I can then talk to these people and like feel, feel out how they'll use the space. Yeah. I yeah. I can, and I want to add on to that too. Like, the, and again, going back to the biennial is a good example since um, the 24 biennial is just about to open or open to the press. Um, mm. I wish I would have given more time afterwards. This is what I think curation doesn't do well. And that is um, a conversation that happens after the exhibition. Um, Managing expectations. Again, the biennial 
uh, even artists who participated in the 2014 biennial who worked in Warhol's studio still, you know, where, where you think they have an understanding of what, you know, a biennial in 2014 actually means to the career. Um, yeah. You know, people still have expectations that I can't measure up to the idea of the biennial can't measure up to, and I wish we would have more conversations. It's not part of the curatorial process from an institutional standpoint to have to have those conversations, both upfront, during, but after. Usually those exhibitions come and we're looking at the next one. That's the idea of, of biennials. We want to stage the new. Um, but I'm really, there's a hole in that process. And that is having those conversations afterwards, talking about those expectations, talking about the shifts in culture. And I'm not even talking about the controversies. Um, you know, usually those controversies kind of suck up and exhaust all of us. Um, but the good work that needs to happen with artists is a different kind of conversation that needs to happen within that curatorial arc. Well, can, I mean, can we talk, can we build off that a little bit because i think that's so important and amazing of something that we talked about in previous conversations was this idea of like franticness or like or or productive franticness or like this this not like fear but this like real like anxiety or suspicion of a show going up there being a talk and it closing you know and instead really thinking about this as a gesture of some kind can you talk about how you you think of those terms yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, um, the twenty my my contribution to the twenty fourteen Whitney Biennial uh, did have controversy, um, and I don't know if it's worth going into, but it, it, you know that you know the institution, uh, like I think how the current exhibition is being talked about, um, the safety of work right now to clearly avoid picturing you know, what is, a, you know, I forgot the quote, but a kind of, um, you know, that is right politics. Um, so there's a kind of safety out there. There's no risk because we know the risk of, uh, and and how that becomes, it, it, the, the problem with the controversy is it's important. We understand it, where it's coming from and the forces behind it, but it also excerp, it excerpts all of the other work in the conversations that can possibly be had. And that is just, really unfortunate to culture because it's those conversations that, you know, that the, the hot pulse of those, uh, you know, troubled um, uh, issues, you know, uh, you know, we should deal with them. We should understand them. Um, but what doesn't get talked about is really a shame often. Uh, but I don't know, Andrew, if that was where you're going. Yeah, kind of. And uh, I mean, I want to keep it really generalized because, uh, you know, I, I don't want to call anyone out but I remember there's a school I was teaching at and it was a class on curation and the whole syllabus was structured on uh controversies like picking a controversy and like parsing it out I just remember being so frustrated by that of like yeah. what about all the artists that were just in those shows you know that yeah. were like uh to to be simplified and flattened out through like clickbait felt really yeah uh anyways uh so I I love that you said that. I, I have a really practical question, another one, because uh, I just know that students are watching and here in the crowd. But like, do you, are you thinking theme first or are you doing more embodied curation or do you switch back and forth? Do you do you start with a, a reading or an idea and then go do visits or is it you kind of sense it after you've done a certain yeah. form of visits? Yeah. What do you yeah. prefer? No, I think, I, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking abstractly. So I'm thinking about how can I put together an exhibition in which a kind of mediation is required from the audience. And by that, another example would be thinking about curriculum when I organize the 2014 biennial. Like what is like breaking it down in terms of how you're, you know, you teach, how do we think about curriculum, right? So how do we present material that can be, again, mediated, how you think about the comparative, how do you think about assessment between works or ideas, um, you know, and not just those ideas that are transactional around capital, but other ideas. So really trying to set through difference and actually to start to, to think a little bit about pluralism um, and the pluralistic and not about the marketplace and inventory, but actually thinking about the kind of intellectual underpinnings that can happen from comparative thinking. Um, this brings us perhaps to the exhibition that's 
currently up at the Milwaukee Art Museum that I curated called 50 Paintings. It's 50 paintings by 50 artists. Some of them you know, you, Lisa Uscavage, Mary Heileman, um, Thomas Edgar, um, so many more, 50 others. Um, and, you know, it was an inexpensive exhibition. The work is um, relatively conventional. Uh, you know, it is a support, um, uh, you know, it, it has very little materiality or um, work that is collage. There's a Peter Halley that is, I guess, a kind of composite of geometries, um, but it's relatively smallish. It's all under 70 by 70 inches. Um, so there is no kind of powerful first embodiment of a painting. You know, when you're standing in front of um, a, a large painting, um, uh, perhaps uh, kind of Sam Gilliam, you have that kind of affected response. Kind of wanted to push that back and thinking about painting and it's kind of pluralistic vocabularies right now mm -hmm. um but not you know not to support and with very little didactics right to really trust yeah. the viewer not just coming in and saying you know my tastes are pulling me you know to this uh amy sherald representation of female figure but actually thinking about the amy sherald next to a camera and martin abstraction and thinking about sameness and difference within that so kind of really setting up that kind of very active assessment that we need to have and not reading narrative necessarily or curatorial thesis and or stories trying to pull back so quite honestly you know i don't you know this is i think what I think what makes me kind of, I don't know, a different kind of curator is that I don't need to be a curator. That is not part of my identity. You know, being in the studio is where, you know, I will fight you to that, you know, identity. I am a, a maker. Um, but, um, you know, when it comes to critical writing or when it comes to curating, you know, uh, it's not that I don't have stakes. I have huge stakes in culture, in arts and artists. Um, but I want to give, a, I want to put forward a condition that is not, obstructed by Michelle Grabner curator um you know get right to let's get right to the heart of the matter let's get right to these objects um and how are they hanging here what is not hanging there not who is not in an exhibition of 50 paintings what is not in the exhibition of 50 paintings what are the languages not represented so again um I may have gone off your question oh, a phenomenal answer <laughs> what just being aware of time. I have one more question. And also, I just want to state that I, I'd love to, I hope we get to have a conversation just about your work at some point, because I uh, love your practice and totally understand that there's something to be said that once you pick up a broom, you become the broom person and you can talk a lot about everything, but the things that you're also working on. Um, but I wanted to go into that last thing you said or ask you about it there's been a lot of writing in the last few years um I, but also i think there's always been this writing of you know the curator becoming an artist or the curator kind of slot fitting artists into you know like zaymon got accused of it eflux wrote an issue about the last i think almost every document is accused of it of like the curator kind of being this megalomaniacal uh you know the artist of the ponds and it's about the whole texture of sculpture. How do you, how do you feel like, cause I think you do, how do you solve that, that you do not do that when you curate? Is it through that I mind and, and avoiding the body or in the, or the 50 show? Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess it's, it's frustrating to me. I mean, that was the rise of, you know, also the curatorial industry, right? That you have these, and to make industry rise and to have, you know, capital flow through it, you need to have these iconic individuals that we all aspire to have that power, right? That authority, you know, and again, that is not, a, that is not the work I want to do. If I'm curating, it is not, I'm not a good spokesperson for it. I don't have the face or the language or the syntax to kind of be that performative curator. Um, yeah, so, you know, and I know it's there, but it also, I think, confuses, it's confusing, but I also think in tandem with institutions, uh, you know, uh, you and I can have another hour conversation about the sameness of institutions and what, um, I don't know, what is valued, and I think a very condescending attitude to the viewer, um, you know, over, uh, you know, getting them into giving, getting viewers in and not even using the word art, but just, you know, getting them into 
uh, for a social or for, a, I don't know, a, some kind of a kids art project of some sort. You know, I, I, I really, I, people, you know, I always say first form of criticism is description. Everybody can describe, although maybe, uh, you know, slightly different with different language, what is in front of them. And then, you know, it's it, we, I, we have to get used to doing that again and not creating these gimmicks of getting people in and putting people in front of work um, that is, you know, too easy in terms of a story. Let's just tell the narrative of the artist and not even look at the work. That is the transaction that happens. Um, or, uh, yeah, I, you know, I just recently left the board of the Milwaukee Art Museum because I just couldn't stand it. I just can't, as an artist, it's not even about watching the sausage be made. It's about watching the sausage not get made. And that <laughs> is, that is crazy as an artist, yeah. um, you know, and I know that this is, it's not the Milwaukee Art Museum. They have, you know, I, I, you know, they, I wouldn't be talking to you if it wasn't for their Bradley collection, um, mm -hmm. uh, which taught me and, uh, you know, through long, long, um, deep, deep hours of slow looking through much of the eighties, um, you know, really taught me to attach myself to, you know, the visual arts and its potential. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'm rambling now. You got to pull me no, back. No. I, I mean, uh, <laughs> pull me in, pull me this in. feels amazing. Like the, uh, the, yeah, I mean, I think it, to go off that point, it's scary how much of art is unintentionally creating middle brow, which is like, I don't know who it's speaking to. It's it's trying to spoon feed an audience or it's mm -hmm. trying to like, uh, it's incredibly, uh, it's like pablum or like, you know, uh, anyways, that's a whole, like you said, a whole other conversation. Whole other conversation and about yeah. even the foundations and what the foundations, every, you know, institutions standing in line for melon money, but what you have to do for the melon money, you know, that's all great, but that's the only thing that's happening. And everybody's doing the same thing because they all want that melon money. I mean, it's scripts, right? right? These are kind of cultural scripts that come with the resources that institutions are desperately needing. It's bad. I mean, it's, it's bad for art and artists. And that is, uh, you know, one of uh, that. I, yeah, that's a problem. Well, uh, maybe just ending on that note, because we have so many questions, but I think that like what I, one of many things I appreciate you about you, Michelle, is that going off the script and going back to what you said, you know, I find myself teaching and working with students a lot that, or just, I mean, artists who are worried about taking on other hats or like wearing multiple hats and what that might mean for them to do that. And I think like what you said, which is like, I'm not a curator, like, or I am, but like, that's not my most important thing. There's yeah. a real freedom in going off the script where you're like, this is just a gig for me. You know, like, I don't have to be front and center. This doesn't have to be about me. I can play with it. I can, you know, be irreverent to it. Like, that's something that is, I think, uh, really necessary, but something that people that are just curators get really concerned about. Because for us, it's like, I don't owe anything to this genre form. I can just do productive play, you know? Yes. No, that's exactly right. And just uh, one last anecdote. Um, when we were putting together the 2000, 2014 biennial, it was Donna DeSalvo uh, wanted to do the layer cake where she would give us eat, the three curators each a floor. We pulled straws for which floor because they get progressively smaller, as you know, with the Breuer building. And she also gave us the option of like, but you don't have to do that, right? If you wanted to do it more traditionally, you know, and just kind of blend it in. And I stood my ground and said, you know, no, I think this is a really interesting idea because we then as curators become accountable. We can't hide under the morass of a broader checklist, but Stuart, and I was sympathetic because both Stuart and Anthony are proper curators. And, you know, there was something risky for them to be exposed on the third floor or the second floor. And, and for me, I had the fourth floor, um, you know, it was something risky, but it was a risk that I could risk because it wasn't my day job. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, so I do, I do, you know, I, I think there is, there, there can be really good work done when one feels a responsibility to artists and art making and culture and its potential um, by not doubling down on a single identity, but being able to just have an ethic and moving forward with an ethic as opposed to an identity or a title. Michelle, there's a list of people that I keep in my mind when I'm uh, getting tired or feeling like I have too much going on or too many projects that I'm like, this person is working hard, I can get back to work. And you're on that list. And I really appreciate all that you do for other artists and yourself in building community. 
And just want to thank you for all of that and also give everyone a chance to ask you many, many questions. But thank you for this conversation. Today. I'll go right back at you. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, coming to see you in New York again soon. We'll have yeah. to talk later, but I think there's a couple, there's some of the shows that you're doing that I'm going to have to see and be in attendance for. People uh, I Absolutely. Like to Anytime. So Let thank me know. you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so, so much, Andrew and Michelle. That was such an inspiring wonderful conversation. Um, so great to hear the dialogue between two of you. And we do have so many questions from the audience today. Um, our first question will be from Fong. Um, so Fong, if you want to unmute, go ahead. Yes, Michelle, thank you. Thank you for coming on our NSE. Uh, thank you, Andrew, also. I um, I will be able to ask a small question, and I won't be able to sit around and get this response because I have a meeting in a few minutes. But uh, I'm that's okay because I'm gonna re watch it later. <laughs> um, yeah, you mentioned I heard the word spoon feeding, which is so great. It reminded me of uh, Ian Froster who once said, "Spoon feeding teaches us nothing except yeah. remind us." Of the shape of the spoon so it's, uh, <laughs> and it's so interesting thinking back i remember once i had this long conversation with mel bachner it was win kamaski gallery it was <laughs> very last end of that run for have a longer decade maybe it was coinciding with mel's show at peter freeman and i believe the interview might have been published in may 20 Oh, two, 2006, I think. <laughs> it's so fascinating because we were talking about, at least I was, asking about his dialectical process, you know? Because in the 80s, when I came to, late 80s, when I came to New York, he had a show at Sonnenberg when he was painting this rather quasi-geometric painterly painting on shape canvases. But he was also at the same time doing all the incredible conceptual works, mm -hmm. you know? So I was trying to ask him, how do you mediate? Being simply, because we had Prem Kinomosti yesterday, the a person who wears many hats, as you do, as I do. And the rail is not your normal conventional newspaper or journal. Yeah. It's a work of art, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Uh, social sculpture, whatever you call it. We call it new social environment. Again, about male, and then he said to me, you know, once he and Robert Smithson was walking the street and they ran into Art Reinhardt, to whom they respected immensely. And certain point he said to them, someday you guys have to choose between Malevich or Dusha. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and Mel and, and, and Smithson look at each other and they shrug to their soldier, shoulders and say, why choose? You know, so it's that's that's the fate where we are now, wearing many hats as fatigue it can be, it's incredible effective in my view as a way to to create community, and also to share the certain fearlessness, yes. of discover your own potential. Is it, potential is what make who we are, not the identity that given to us. Uh, that's my question. So. Where where do you find that stamina and that vision to do what you do? Um, thank thank you. you. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for that. And you're right. The rail is exactly, uh, again, there's some you know, a parallel with uh, the poor farm or how we think about the poor farm or, or yeah, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, we have a tendency to want to be specialists because then we can, you know, build a kind of, power structure and uniqueness within that work that we do, but it becomes limiting. Um, you know, you, you, you hit walls. I, you know, I'm not going to be as articulate as you are, Fong, um, but I, I really do think it's an ethic. I think it's a belief system in something that's greater than yourself. I think it's that simple. Um, I believe in other people and culture and what art can do. It doesn't always have to transform. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be beautiful. Uh, you know, it should fail. It should break apart. Um, but that is bigger than I am as an individual. And I just need to be in the conditions where that happens. And I also need to be in the conditions myself and my students to assess that to push at it, 
to undo it and to put it together again. So, um, yeah, I, again, it's, I, 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 it sounds like a cliche, but it's, um, you know, I'm doing it not, not, not for me. I'm, you know, I, yeah. I'm doing it for something bigger, you know, and, and that can, it's, a, it's about discourse and how do we make that happen and what is our responsibility to it? So yeah. thank you for your work. Yeah. Oh, I, thank you. Uh, we need more Michelle Grabner in the world. <laughs> uh, definitely, uh, it, it, the, as democracy meant to be constantly experimented, not yes. to be made into a machine. Yes. And it is a machine now, so we got to go back and read re civil disobedience. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Thank you so much. Got to run, but uh, can't wait to see you when you come to New York, Michelle. That's good. See you later, Fong. Bye. Bye, you guys. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much, Fong, for that question. Um, thanks, Michelle, for answering. Um, our next question is from GE, and I'll ask on his behalf. Um, GE wrote, have any artists excavated perhaps the darker history of poor farms, either with installation or installations or performances? No, not not that specifically. We do here in Wisconsin, believe it or not, have multiple paranormal societies who uh, on occasion will want to come through. Um, I, again, always say yes. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the result is. Uh, I have a dear, dear friend, uh, Megha Ligiran, who is a painter, um, an artist who lives in Marfa. Um, and I'm sad because she was up there once and she could not be in that space. There was something something troubling for her, um, a kind of spiritual thing that I can't articulate. Um, so I, I miss, I, I, that is, a, that is a, an obstacle for me because I love her so much and I would like to spend time with her. And uh, she just can't be up there for some for, for something that I may not be able to understand, but I believe that she does and I respect that. So, um, but no, not when it comes to kind of art making. I think again, the current exhibition Model Home and Model Home 2, which is happening this summer, where you saw the um, Felix Gonzalez Therese billboard, um, that is going to be uh, um, uh, part of Mobile Home 2, again, uh, working with Peter Scott on that. Um, so that is, that is, thinking around uh, the poor farm, but not it's not kind of meeting it on a, at its abject, if I understand the question. Thank you. Thanks for that question, GE. Um, our next question is from Catherine, and I will allow Catherine to unmute to ask. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Hi, Michelle. Um, and, and Andrew, thank you so much. This is a great conversation. Um, I'm in Madison, Wisconsin, so not too far. And I'm actually from Appleton, Michelle. Um, I've been wondering, um, I have never been to the poor farm. I've been following it and I just have this vague idea. I just actually looked it up again um, to see where it is. I'd like to visit it. Um, I'm also interested in how an artist, since you don't have an application, how does someone, um, get in touch if you have an idea or to find out more about what could be done or like how to get involved. And then the, kind of the same question with the Suburban, I've been to the Suburban a couple of times. Um, and, uh, but anyway, I, they're both fantastic projects and thanks. Uh, thanks, Catherine. Yeah, sure. No, thank you for that question. Um, so uh, there is a residency, uh, it's not a program, but we have residents who come in and out. It's very fluid. Sometimes people are there for a couple of days, um, a weekend, three weeks. Um, it depends. There's a Google Doc that you sign up on a Google Doc. That's it. Um, and, uh, you know, I will come and leave you a bottle of wine. There's a lot of instructions. And I need to credit two very beautiful, important people who really help with the residency program, yes. which has the, uh, um, it's within the play. Um, uh, that's kind of the title of the residency program. Um, it's uh, Mark Jeffries and Kelly Kaczynski, both colleagues of mine at the Art Institute. So it's Mark and Kelly who really kind of take responsibility for the Google Doc. And I will just send you a link. Um, I need to put it on the website, um, but really exciting. Um, both Kelly and Mark now for spend, this will be the third year, is also hosting a poor farm residency in Monte Castello de Vibio in um, Umbria. 
And that is a three week residency. And those, I, I think when you were seeing pictures of people gathered around the, the uh, Ubrian landscape, that's what you were looking at, the last two cohorts um, that uh, went with Mark and Kelly. And again, if uh, unlike the poor farm where you pay nothing, you get very little in return, you do have some fees that come with um, the residency uh, in Umbria, um, but they don't go through the poor farm at all. They go directly to this hosting um, uh, school in Monte Castello de Bibio. And I can send you information on that as well. Um, I'm not going to be able to join. I have to do some work in Korea this summer, um, but Kelly and Mark um, you know, are super fantastic and really always expanding and thinking about the resin residency in different ways. We, that's That's the conversation that we have around the residency. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michelle. Thank you, Catherine. Um, our next question is from Lane, and I will ask on Lane's behalf. Um, how do you manage visitors who are not school affiliated or group affiliated? Um, and also is asking for some of the links that you mentioned, um, Michelle. Yes. Uh I will put those links on the website and also just email me and I can send them directly to you, michellegrabner.gmail.com. And we handle people who uh, you know, aren't less necessarily at SAIC or from another institution the same way. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, again, we fill beds, um, you know, whoever's going to be there at any given time. People often come up in groups, um, you know, but self-organized groups. Uh, um, you're absolutely welcome. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, our final question today will be from Jared. And Jared, I will allow you to unmute us. Cool. Hi, this is such a good conversation. Thank you. Um, I guess I was really excited by um, this example of having really rigorous discourse outside of like cultural seats of power. And um, I I guess I, I spent the last five years working at the Bemis Center in Omaha, Nebraska, not exactly a cultural hub, but there was always this sense of like an umbilical cord to these urban centers where we're kind of importing talent. And I some of the artists that you referenced, I the ones that I knew are also kind of based in urban centers. And so I guess my question is, what is your sense on, like, is there a version of our future where more rural places can be in their own right, major cultural producers. Um, and I guess also with like rising housing costs and cost of living, like yeah. urban centers are so inaccessible. And like, are you telling your students, like, do you still need to go to the big city to be an artist? Like, do you have to do a stint there? Can you just make it where it's a little bit less, uh, more affordable? Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, um, thank you for that. Yeah, I always have a fantasy that, you know, the big grant comes in. And mind you, I don't even apply to grants because we are so nondescript. Um, if we um, uh, think of ourselves as an appeal, nobody's going to, you know this, uh, you know, to get those grants at Bemis, you know, you have to have an outcome. There has to be an outcome, right? Which votes get raised? Uh, you know, which communities are you leaning into? Uh, you know, which K through 12 groups? And, you know, and then money can come in. But again, all applications are just blessed the same, right? They have the same kind of uh, measures. Um, and, you know, I, I fundamentally don't want to do that because that would homogenize, you know, what the suburban or and the poor farm can do um, in relationship to other institutions. So, you know, that means I, the resources aren't always there. They, they really come from our paychecks for the, for the most part. Um, but yeah, you know, I think this is why the suburban is a suburban. We're thinking of what can happen in the suburbs as opposed to, you know, the centers and what can happen in rural communities. And, you know, I often think about, um, yes, real estate, you know, it is, uh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm old folks, um, you know, and, and, you know, it was, you know, we took out loans for some things when we could, knowing that there was a kind of freedom to having that, you know, having a place in which, you know, others can come, right? It wasn't, but, uh, and things can happen. Um, I hope so. I don't know how to answer that question, except with hope. Um, I think conceptually, being at a diff at distance from centers, you can see what centers should be doing and what they're not doing. You can see those blind spots pretty, pretty clearly. Um, 
I love being, you know, properly in the upper Midwest and, and looking into, uh, you know, uh, New York, not always as a critique, but, you know, it taught me a lot. Um, and I tell students all the time, you know, for some of you, go to New York, you get off the plane at LaGuardia, they will give you a script on how to succeed. And, you know, you play through that script. If you stick around Chicago or Milwaukee or the rural hinterland, you have to do additional work of assessing the work that you're doing. You always have to kind of give language. And when you are not being seen because you are so far away, it's the easiest thing to not be you know, part of the conversation. You really have to like understand the work that you're doing in a kind of obscurity for maybe some periods of time and still know that it is the good work. I think that's hard for a lot of people. Um, and for others, you know, uh, who are driven, um, uh, you know, I'm doing it with my husband, I, you know, doing it alone would be a kind of labor I probably couldn't, wouldn't be able to do. Um, so, you know, doing it in partnership does help. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, uh, yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I'll continue doing it. It's the best work I do. I mean, the, the, just hosting the poor farm, not the, again, the, uh, anything necessarily structural. It's just like, maintaining it and having it there and to let others kind of keep defining it and intersect it, um, you know, and bringing, you know, different kinds of breath to it. Wonderful. Such a great question, Jared. Thank you. And thank you, Michelle, for that wonderful answer. Um, to conclude our NSC today, I'm so excited to pass it back over to Michelle for a reading before we close out. Well, Eleanor, <laughs> you know, my language is struggling. Um, if everybody goes to the Poor Farm website, you will see a pretty long poem written by um, an important cultural art historian named uh, Linda Nochlin. And she wrote it about the Poor Farm. She was unable to come to Moira Roth, who is no longer with us, but another important art historian. We hosted her best trip. Long, long uh, art historian teaching at Mills College. Um, and to have her up for the summer and have all of her former students who are now PhDs in art history or just fans or under people who just have encountered her over the years um, to celebrate her in 2010. And Linda was planning on coming up and she couldn't, um, something came up. So she wrote um, a, a poem, I couldn't make it to the poor farm. And I'm just gonna read you just a couple of lines, but please read through the whole thing because it is a way of coming to understand the oppression that happened in these um, um, rural uh, government institutions. I couldn't make it to the poor farm, but it, I, but it I know what it's like. I've seen it in my dreams, always on a hill, a lawn of weeds in front, a few bent figures, scattered here and there, postures unforgiving, anonymous suffrage. So thinking about, and, and it goes on, um, and again, I wish I could read poetry in a most beautiful way, um, but please read the whole thing and try to understand that everybody who comes to the poor farm, you know, it's it's good to recognize um, the history of the poor farm, um, you know, both ob objectively, um, what it was as a social institution, why it was seen as progressive, um, and where it absolutely failed human beings and crushed, you know, spirits and the imagination. So everybody who comes to the poor, poor farm, I, you know, I, the only thing I ask is to live into the imagination you do have, because, um, you know, clearly the, the inmates at this particular poor farm in Wapaka County, that was taken away from them. So, um, yeah, um, please read it. Um, you know, it's worth kind of sketching around the history. I didn't give you too much of the history of poor farms or um, almshouses or uh, um, um, poor houses in cities, but um, it is, uh, it, you know, we, they're, they're still with us, um, but they take different forms um, and we all have to be attentive to those. Amazing. Thank you for that reading, Michelle, and everyone definitely check out the poem. It's really beautiful. Um, thank you so so much Andrew also and Michelle again for this amazing dialogue it's been so brilliant um I'm so grateful to have been able to hear everything um and 
Thank you as well, as always, to the Terra Foundation for American Art for sponsoring the NSC and for supporting our archive, which you can explore on the Rails YouTube channel. And this conversation will be posted there very soon. The Rail has been free and independent for 25 for 23 years. Uh, donation directly supports our writers, production staff, and operations. And you can support our work through a link in the chat. Um, join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern for a conversation with Tanya L. Corey and Laurel V. McLaughlin on L. Corey's show, Cultural Exchange Rate at Prior Performing Arts Center in Worcester, Mass. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in today as well. And you can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as we head into the rest of our days. Eleanor, thank you. And Andrew, I'll talk thank to you anytime. You can, yeah. anytime. You're the best. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Bye. Thank you, so thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.